You are listening to the Anxiety Podcast, where we support you to overcome anxiety and reduce stress. We will get vulnerable and it will be real. Here's your host, Tim J.P. Collins. Hello and welcome to the Anxiety Podcast. Today I'm doing something I haven't done in a long time. A long time. I don't even know how long it's been. I haven't been back to check, but it's probably been a couple of years since I've done an interview on the Anxiety Podcast. And today is a longer episode. You probably looked at your uh, Apple Music or your Amazon or your Spotify and you thought, oh my goodness, I've got 60 minutes to listen to. This is going to be amazing. And it is. Uh... <laughs> Don't hype up too much, Tim. Anyway, I'm doing an interview. Uh, excited about this one. Uh, it's a topic I've been talking about on and off quite a lot lately. Alcohol, my relation to it, ship to it, your relationship to it, how it affects anxiety, why it's probably not a good idea to consume if you've got anxiety, particularly in large quantities, hangovers, guilt, shame, all those horrible things. Uh, anyway, I've connected with somebody recently who uh, was was willing to share a bit more about it. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, before I get on to that, this episode is brought to us and uh, sponsored by BetterHelp. Um, BetterHelp is, is an ongoing sponsor of the Anxiety Podcast. I've talked about it quite a lot. Um, you can connect with people in a safe online environment. Um, it's not self-help, it's professional counselling. You can choose from lots of different counsellors to speak to, uh, schedule weekly calls or bi-weekly calls or monthly calls or whatever you like. And if you don't like the person they set you up with, you're allowed to change your mind so you can pick somebody else. Um so they're committed to making sure that you have a good connection. Um, you don't have to go into any stinky waiting rooms <laughs> to connect with your counsellor. Um, you can do it online. You can be on video, off video, uh, which is particularly useful if you've got anxiety uh, and kind of work through that. They also help with things like depression, um, sleeping, trauma, self-esteem, grief, LGBT matters, all sorts of stuff. Uh, it's confidential. It's professional. It is good. Um, so, if you want to join over a million people taking charge of their mental health, you can go to betterhelp.com slash anxiety podcast and get 10% off with, uh, yeah, by going to that link specifically. Um, so, yeah, go to betterhelp.com slash anxiety podcast. All right. So, as I mentioned, I'm doing an interview. Was very excited about this one. I'm now thinking, oh, maybe I'll do other interviews uh, it's a bit harder to set up and a bit more difficult to sort of carve the time out, but uh, it's also great speaking to people with unique insights and points of view, particularly things which I'm actively interested in, like the old alcohol conversation. Um, I'll probably shut up about it after this, and I don't know what I'm going to do anyway, but uh, yeah, probably stop talking about it for a bit. Um, but yeah, connected with Gillian. Um, her name's Gillian Teets, and she has a podcast called The Sober Powered Podcast. So you should check that out. She talks about lots of different, you know, how do you deal with people trying to pressure you into drinking? You know, what what should you do when you go out? Uh, we talk about recent events we've been to and uh, how we manage those. So anyway, without further ado, let's chat to Gillian. Okay, so Gillian Teets, welcome to the Anxiety Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, very excited to have you on. And this is a topic which I am uh, very excited to talk about. I mean, any of my podcast listeners will know I've been banging on about alcohol and my relationship with it and how do I feel about it and do I want to drink or not want to drink. So it's something that's very um, current in my mind. And uh, I think what's sort of served me well uh, whilst doing the podcast is talking about things that I'm experiencing in my life and sort of sharing that part of the journey. Right. Um, yeah, definitely. And I haven't done an interview for ages, so this is exciting. And, um, and I'm, I suppose just because of you, you kind of coming along at the perfect time and me wanting to talk about this, it seems like, uh, it seems like the setting the stage for a really good conversation. So, um, I'd love it if you could um, introduce a bit of your story and kind of, um, you know, set the scene a little bit in terms of where you've come from and just tell everybody a bit about you. Yeah. So I am two years sober. Um, I celebrated two years of sobriety in early November 
And I also work as a biochemist. That's my day job. But I started drinking back when I was 22. So I did not drink in college, which is a little um, unusual, I think. But I was very dedicated to studying and drinking just wasn't a part of my life. But I started because I wanted other people to like me and I felt this social pressure. I was the only person who didn't drink in grad school. And I was afraid with everybody going to the bars all the time and all these happy hours at school with the professors, I was afraid people wouldn't like me or want to be my friend if I didn't drink too. So I just started ordering what my friends were getting because I didn't even know like what to get. And it took like a couple times, but the first time like I got my real proper buzz on, I thought like, yes, <laughs> this is why people drink. Now I understand. I can't believe I waited so long. Um, and it was immediately an issue. I didn't have any understanding of like how much was too much. And I didn't have any control over myself. I really didn't have the ability to stop once I started. My mind would kept would keep just telling me like, oh, one more is a great idea. One more, one more. You're having fun now. Well, you'll have even more fun if you have one more drink. And because of that, I got drunk a lot. I was very sloppy, um, would get sick. It was very embarrassing. And then very quickly, I became a daily drinker because what I learned in grad school is when you feel stressed out or overwhelmed, alcohol fixes that for you. And since I had a lot of stress, I drank every day. It made perfect sense to me. Um, and then a few years later, I started to have some pretty significant mental health issues because of that. So I've always struggled with depression um, and that was getting worse and worse, which I would blame on like certain liquors. Like I decided, oh, I can't have margaritas anymore. Those make me depressed. So I was putting that off and then eventually I developed anxiety, which is something that I had never struggled with before and it was keeping me up. So when you drink a lot, you will eventually go to bed and maybe pass out. Maybe you were in a blackout or um, your memories are fuzzy and then you jolt awake in the middle of the night as the alcohol starts to wear off and that's when the anxiety would hit me. Sometimes for people, it hits them the next morning, but for me, it would get me in the middle of the night. And that um, during that time, I would just force myself to lie awake. The room would zoom out. I felt really uncomfortable and out of control. And eventually my depression started to get worse too. The anxiety was getting worse. I felt very suicidal. And that ended up being the catalyst for finally stopping and getting sober is the realization that these suicidal thoughts could actually turn into something that I act on. The anxiety, even though it was keeping me up most nights of the week, it still wasn't like bad enough. I thought it was normal and everybody just deals with anxiety all night long, but it was the suicidal thoughts that made me realize like, this is very scary. And I was finally able to accept that if I drink, it just means horrible anxiety and suicidal thoughts. And uh, two years ago, I was able to stop. Yeah, that's quite the story. So there's there's a few parts there to, to unpack for sure. But um, from when you started drinking to when you stopped, how long was that? Seven years. So I started drinking at 22 and I stopped at 29. Yeah. And when you, when you got, when you got going, um, was it a daily thing for you? Yeah. So by the end of the first year of drinking, it was every single day. Um, and then it stayed every single day for a long time. So when I was 27, I started questioning it and wondering like, how do you know if you're an alcoholic? I used to Google it. Um, and take those quizzes online. And I went to a therapist and asked, actually, I said, how do I know if I'm an alcoholic? How can you tell? Um, and she challenged me to do one week without drinking and just see how it went. And that was the first time I had ever skipped in five years. Um, and I skipped the week and I was like, okay, 
not an alcoholic. We're good. Um, and then I went back to it. And then after that was when all the mental health problems started happening. And then I actually challenged myself to do 90 days sober to try to cure all of those problems so that I could drink moderately. Um, and I noticed like, wow, I don't have any anxiety anymore. I'm not staying up all night. The room isn't zooming out. I don't feel suicidal. And that break allowed me to finally connect the dots between cause and effect of my drinking. So then when all of the anxiety and suicidal thoughts came back after I started drinking again, then I was able to accept like, okay, well, this just means I can never drink ever again. And when you were drinking um, back in the day, what was your uh, weapon of choice? Like what, what were you drinking mostly? Yeah, so I would drink anything. Um, but if I had a choice, I really was a wine drinker. Um, and sometimes I would dip into like liquor if I drank all the wine. So eventually like we stopped keeping any liquor in the house or if my husband is just an, a social drinker, he has no issue with it. So I would also finish his beers <laughs> if they were around. Um, but I would always start with wine. That was my favorite. It sounds like when I was uh, a young man in uh, England, we would go to nightclubs and you would see people who'd run out of money and they would just go and pick up like <laughs> pint, pint glasses off the shelf and just like drain whatever was still in it. Yep. I, I would probably have done the same thing. Don't let that yeah. precious alcohol go to waste. Right. Somebody spent a long time brewing that and caring for it. <laughs> you make sure you finish your, all of it. Um. Does your husband still drink? He does. Yeah. So he used to drink um, a decent amount with me and he didn't drink every single day, but he drank often. And he always had this really annoying ability to switch to water. And I couldn't understand how he could do that and why he wouldn't help me do that. <laughs> so I went through this period where like, I tried to get him to help me moderate and um, and then when I stopped drinking, one of my biggest fears was that we would stop connecting or that he would think I was boring because our relationship was kind of based around like going out and drinking and going to bars. But he just naturally backed off because for him, drinking alone just isn't enjoyable anymore. Like he, he decided to just do other things with me instead, but he does still drink occasionally. Do you ever talk to him about that? Like, does he, um, I guess for him, is it more social, like with other people kind of thing? So, yeah. So he will yeah. go out with work people and drink and like party or do happy hour or something. And if we go to a wedding, he'll drink a lot there. Um, and then when we go on dates, he'll have like one or two drinks, something like that. So he does drink um, al alone around me, I guess is kind of the best way to say it, but he's never like getting drunk around me. He just has like one to two drinks. Yeah. And you're, you're okay with that in terms of you're able to like, it doesn't make you feel like, Oh, I wish I could have one. Yeah. That's a really good question. So when I stopped drinking, um, he also really enjoyed drinking wine and I, I didn't stop drinking because I was sick of drinking or I just decided, you know, it wasn't good for me anymore. I stopped drinking because I felt that I had no other choice. So that didn't mean that if he had wine around me, I'm not going to be sitting there like staring at it and, and obsessing over it. So I asked if he could not drink wine around me ever. Um, and maybe that sounds kind of selfish to some people, but I like wine a million billion times more than he can ever understand about liking alcohol. Um, so he drinks beer around me or cocktails. And then when he's out with other people, he can have wine and that's not a big deal, but yeah, it, it helps me so much when he doesn't drink wine around me. I've had other people drink wine around me and that, that still gets weird. That's something to get used to. So I go ask like, um, the the age old question which you you come up against when you are a non drinker um, in a drinking environment I don't know what the statistics are maybe you know but I looked at it recently and it was like I like I don't know like fifty or sixty percent of adults drink alcohol 
Um, so it's like two out of three people maybe drink alcohol. But if you're a non-drinker um, and you go out with friends, maybe people who don't know you as well, or you go to a wedding or a work event or something and, and people have an alcohol and, and you're like, no, 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 I'm, I'm fine, thanks. Um, and somebody's like, oh, come on, just have one. Do you ever get that still? And, and how do you respond to that? I got that a lot in the beginning. I had, <clears throat> excuse me, I had a lot of people questioning me. Why do you have to stop? Why can't you just have one? I don't understand why you can't just drink less, that kind of thing. Um, are you really never going to drink ever again? And some people I explained to them if they were very close to me, if they were um, like random coworkers or something like that, I wouldn't explain it. I simply just say, I don't drink. And when they push and say, oh, why not? Oh, come on, whatever. I just say, I just don't drink. I had one coworker. This was probably the worst. Um, we were at a happy hour. I think I was like two weeks sober. It was so new and I was so weird about it. And I went to this happy hour and I got a mocktail. And unfortunately, she heard me order it. Otherwise, I would have been safe. But um, she came up to me in front of everybody, like my boss, my boss's boss, and my boss's boss's boss. Like everybody was there and very That's loudly. A lot of bosses. It's a lot of bosses. Yeah. <laughs> it went all the way up. <laughs> <laughs> so all these people I'm trying to impress. Um, and she's like, you're still not drinking? Like, why not? And she was really like in my face about it, like demanding to know why. And I have, this is the one time in my life I've been grateful for this, but I have a natural freeze response. And she freaked me out so much that I froze and I didn't respond. And I'm thinking in my head, like, what do I say to this crazy person in front of all these bosses? And like all my coworkers and nobody knows my situation. And I just stared at her. And eventually she answered her own question and walked away. She just decided, oh, you must be on a cleanse because you are a healthy person. And she, she just answered her own question and walked away. So sometimes saying nothing is really helpful. But in a lot of cases, if I can be alone and order like a non-alcoholic beer or a mocktail, I look like everybody else and nobody questions me. So I think that's a good tip. If anyone's like considering doing dry January and you're worried about that mocktails, make, like no one would ever know, or like a soda water with a lime, if you don't want to do a mocktail. Yeah, I've, um, I've actually noticed, I don't know whether it's because I've been buying them more or um, whether it's Facebook retargeting me or Instagram following me around, but <laughs> I've noticed there seems to be a lot more like, uh, non-alcoholic craft beers coming out mm -hmm. um i used to be very into my like ipas and all these different styles of beer and now i'm finding like there's a there's a really cool company in toronto that makes um alcohol free beer and it tastes delicious and it's actually got 10 calories a can so it's not even like a, a calorie question it's just yeah I just when i feel like a beer i have a couple of those and I don't feel drunk. I don't have a headache and it, it kind of does the job most of the time, you know? Yeah. Um, it's the same vibe without any of the consequences. Yeah. I think sometimes some, I don't know whether some of it's a bit of a placebo, but sometimes when I crack open one of those and I'm watching sports on TV, I do still feel a bit euphoric or I still feel a bit of something, even mm -hmm. though I'm not actually drinking alcohol. It's just like the association of it, you know? Yeah. The mind is super powerful. And for me, um, when I like, there's, there's so many different alcohol-free beers, but there's also alcohol-free wines and alcohol-free liquors. There's something like of every kind of alcohol you could imagine. And some of them even have zero calories, which is really cool. But some of those make me feel very guilty because my mind, it tastes very similar and it smells very similar especially the non-alcoholic liquors and my mind like picks up on that, that I must be doing something wrong. And sometimes I feel very guilty for it. So they're, they're very authentic. And if anyone hasn't tried them, you should totally try them. Yeah. I mean, um, it kind of makes sense. I suppose that part of me thinks like, well, if I don't want to drink beer, just don't drink beer. Like, why am I trying to substitute, you know, you know what yeah. I mean? It's like, uh, I think that about like when people try and do, 
Um, and, and my listeners know I've done a variety of hardcore different diets over the year and over the years in terms of like low carb and ketogenic and all these types of things. And, and I've noticed with, I did ketogenic, a ketogenic diet like 10 years ago before it became like this big fad. And when it became a big fad, people started inventing like ketogenic chocolate bars and ketogenic this. And it's like, if you want to do it properly, just like, you know, don't eat carbs and eat healthy vegetables and meats that work for you and stuff like that, you know? So I don't know. Sometimes I'm like, why am I working around this? Um, but if it tastes good and it, and it does the job, I think it's, uh, it's fine. Um, but in going back to the question of like what to say to people, I find that interesting because um, that's come up for me a few times. And, and for anybody listening who's trying to figure, figure that out, when I did my 75 hard challenge, which was, I don't know if you've ever heard of 75 hard GL before, have you? Yeah, I have a couple of friends yeah. who are actually doing it right now. Yeah, so you've heard of it, and my listeners know because they've they've uh, painstakingly <laughs> heard me talk about it. Um, but yeah, you could just say I'm doing 75 hard, or I'm ju- I'm doing a, a you don't even have to say that. You could just say I'm doing a health challenge where I don't drink for the month of whatever month you happen to be in. If it's a if it's a one off interaction with another person, and that way they they're going to be like, oh, oh, fair enough, and and maybe give you less of a hard time. Yeah, um, and dry January or sober October or like the very popular ones. I think those are easy to say like, Oh yeah, I'm participating in dry January. So many people participate in that every year. There's nothing unusual about it. Do you ever feel like just saying I'm an alcoholic? So don't ask me. (laughs) Sometimes I've been very tempted. Um, Like I think now if someone gave me a hard time, I would probably say something more like that. My brother gave me a hard time in the beginning, not because he's a jerk or anything, just because he genuinely did not understand. He has the ability to choose how much he drinks, to choose to stop once he starts. And he just couldn't fathom um, having the inability to to choose. And he was giving me a really hard time because the only time he would ever party is when we went out together. And he kept like, you, why can't you just have one drink? Why do you have to stop? Like, and it was very early in my sobriety. And I looked at him and I was like, because alcohol makes me want to kill myself when I drink it. So I can't drink it. I'm sorry. <laughs> and he was just like sitting there in shock. And now he's been my biggest champion ever. But in the beginning, I felt a lot of shame. Like that, that alcoholic word is like, Ooh, you know, um, so I wanted yeah, to hide. One. Yeah, I wanted to hide and avoid judgment and people labeling me and all of that. But the longer that I've been sober, the easier it is to just brush off any kind of judgment. And most of the time I'm making up that judgment in my head. Like in my experience, no one has ever judged me in two years, even very hardcore drinkers. Yeah, which is good. I think I don't know what it is about human nature but um we want people to be in it with us and so i think that's why if other people are drinking and you're not drinking they think that you're in a different headspace which i I guess ultimately you are it's it's uh it's a slightly different experience alcohol you know removes inhibitions and makes people more relaxed and changes your mental state a little bit for sure but um it always seems to be a trigger for other people. Maybe I think they're worried about you potentially judging them if you're not drinking and they're drinking and they, you know, people start to get progressively more sloppy as time goes on um, when they, when they drink a lot. So there's, there's lots of moving parts involved. Um, But I think if you, if you have, you say something serious, as you said to your brother, um, people are then ultimately going to be like, yeah, okay fair enough. Like if it makes you feel that bad, it's not worth doing. Right. (laughs) Yeah. And there's some people that do know my situation and they're super supportive of it. Um, and even people like I went to my first wedding, not drinking about six weeks ago and everyone was so kind. Like one person asked me like, Oh, you're not, you're not drinking. And I said, no, I don't drink. And then she asked if it was okay to ask me questions about it. And I thought that Mm. was really kind. Um, And yeah, people either just don't care or they're very kind when they ask, except that one crazy coworker in the beginning with all the bosses. Mm. And you gave her the stare down. You're like, shut up. (laughs) Don't question me. Back off. 
<laughs> and she did so yeah, yeah just do the stare down if you don't know what to yeah. say just stare them right in their face <laughs> yeah um i think it's great um but it is it continues to be something which kind of i don't know where i stand on it i'm totally mm-hmm. i'm totally out to lunch on this one just because um i started 75 hard uh on the first of september but i hadn't drunk for a couple of weeks leading up to that just because i just hadn't had the opportunity and um so yeah now it's been like three months since i had a drink and uh, i went to a wedding during that time traveled a little bit obviously trying to pursue a health challenge makes it much easier to abstain because you're you're trying to make some healthy progress and alcohol is like the opposite of that at least for me anyway um but i do think back to uh, you know your talk of waking up in the middle of the night one of the biggest deterrence for me with it is just that i know if i drink i could have a couple of drinks and then hydrate a little bit and go to bed and i'd probably be all right um but if i got drunk and then went to bed i know that i'm going to wake up at two o'clock in the morning i'm probably going to be sweating i'm going to feel anxious and my sleep's going to be shit the next day i'm going to feel bad and uh and as i got older in life the amount of time i felt bad for went from like you know, half a day of hangover to like three days later, I'm still a little bit fuzzy headed and I'm still a little, not quite cognitively as sharp as I previously was. And so all those things combined, I just kind of now I'm just, I'm almost overthinking alcohol so much that it's like no fun before it even starts. Cause I just, I'm thinking of consequences. I'm not thinking of like, woohoo, this is going to be so fun. Okay. <laughs> Psyching myself out. Yeah. And that's, that's a good thing to think about the consequences. And um, like I, I talk to my husband a lot about his experience because I just can't understand why someone wouldn't want to drink every single day and all night. Like it's the most amazing thing ever. Why? Like I just can't like people that have half a drink and then leave, like, why would you leave that? So I ask him a lot about his experience. Um, and I've learned that he weighs the consequences he thinks about the next day. And if he decides to have, you know, more than two drinks, he thought about tomorrow's him and he made that choice. And I think considering those things and like being honest with how's your sleep going to be, how's your mental health going to be tomorrow? Because a lot of people get very depressed after drinking too and, and considering it, or, or you can alternate between a regular beer and an alcohol-free beer, or there's a lot of these um, alcohol-free liquor brands that are advertising that you can do like half seas. Like there are a lot of things if you are someone that has the ability to choose that you can do so that you can still have fun and participate and drink your drinks, but you can remove the suffering from it too. Yeah. I mean, um, I am, I'm totally there. I've, I've heard the saying before that drinking alcohol is like borrowing tomorrow's happiness for today. Yep. Um, that's a pretty, a pretty good one. But, wise uh, words. Yeah, it is very wise. And now I have, um, I've got teenage sons who are often these days say to me, like, why don't you drink or why do you only drink beer with no alcohol in it? Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, most of the time I just say, because I, I don't want to, I, I feel like I value the time I have in my life enough that I don't want to waste it. I love that. Um, And so, yeah, I do think about the consequence. I mean, at this stage of my life, I think about the consequences so much that I, I won't drink. Um, And, you know, I can imagine, particularly if I go back to England and see my family and we're out of the pub and then there's some, you know, they used to me being weird though, and abstaining from (laughs) a variety of things. So they'll be like, all right, last time you weren't eating, Carbs, now you're not drinking beer. Fair enough. On a cleanse. Um, yeah, on another cleanse. <laughs> um, yeah, but I still have, there's, there's a nostalgia associated with it with me where I think about, if I think back in my memory, I, I think it's, uh, there's been times in my life where I've been drinking and it's been like, it has been amazing. Um, I think back to the days when I worked in Manhattan and we used to go to the pub after work and we'd, go to one pub and then we'd jump in a taxi and zip down the street and we'd be on a rooftop hotel somewhere having a few drinks and then go somewhere else um so there have been some like really fun times 
uh, on the plus side, on the dark side, the worst things in my life I've ever done have been when I've been drinking mm -hmm. in terms of the most thing, the things which have been most dangerous for my own health and safety, you know, staying alive, um, doing dangerous things, saying things or not saying things because a big part of my anxiety historically was to go out, get drunk and then wake up the next day and have that sort of, Oh my God, what did I say? And then phone my friends. Did I say anything stupid? Did I resign? Did I, you know, <laughs> upset somebody? And just like, you know, anxiety that, you know, the definition of anxiety sometimes for people is like chasing thoughts around your head that you can't quite grasp. And alcohol seems to make that like just, just a hectic melting pot of confusion and, and self doubt, you know? Yeah. There's a huge connection between alcohol and anxiety, whether it's something that you have before drinking um, or like me, something that I developed from my drinking, but you don't have to be someone who has a problem to have anxiety after drinking alcohol. Um, same with depression. It's even just from one drinking experience. If you go a little overboard or you get a little drunk, you might wake up and your mental health is all messed up and you have a hangover and so, yeah, it's a huge connection between the two. Yeah. So at, the, at this point in my life, I don't know if I will drink again or when I'll drink again. I, I find like absolutes to be hard to deal with mm -hmm. um, because uh, my friend always says to me, but what if you're like, you know, sat on the side of some beautiful lake in Scotland and somebody gives you a 15 year old glass of whiskey. I don't really like whiskey, but I'm just trying to create some, I'm trying to conjure up some beautiful uh, scene. Then would you try it? And I'm like, well, oh, yeah, but I suppose, um, and maybe there are people who have that sort of um, experience where, you know, they've, they've moved away from crushing a case of beer every night to now just reserving alcohol consumption for very special occasions or very special situations, you know? Um, yeah, definitely. I think there's some people that um, when they're younger and their bodies can handle it better, or maybe they're going through times of grief or times of intense stress where they rely on alcohol a bit more than usually, but they always have like that element of choice and deciding when to start and stop. And then eventually they decide to back off again and maybe that it's not worth it. They weigh out the cause and effect, and then they decide on, you know, maybe a special occasion type of relationship as they get older. So what do you do for fun these days to replace it? Oh, I do everything. So before I used to just move around and sit in different locations and drink. Move around. <laughs> I used From to the go. couch to the dining table <laughs> to the pub. Exactly. I used to just go sit places um, and drink and then go to bed and hate myself and be hungover all day and then, you know, get through work and repeat, do it again. Um, that's all I ever did. And I used to obsess about alcohol all the time. I thought about it 24 seven. So now that I don't drink, I freed up a ridiculous amount of time, so much time. It's like I quit a second full-time job and I can do anything I want now. Like I don't have to decide, oh, is there going to be alcohol there? Because if it's not there, I don't want to do it. So now my husband and I hike a lot. We went to Malibu a couple months ago and did all these amazing hikes. And I would have never done that because I would have been too hungover or there, you know, you don't drink alcohol on a hike. So I wouldn't have been interested. Um, traveling is much more enjoyable because I'm not just moving from different sitting places. <laughs> I'm like actually doing stuff. Um, but on a regular day, I read now. I watch movies because I can remember the whole movie. Um, I socialize with people. I'm not just getting drunk with people. Um, and at the end of my drinking, I really isolated a lot. So yeah, I do everything. I do a lot of boring stuff, which is great. I exercise consistently. Um, I'm just really happy and, and enjoying being present in the moment and not suffering all day anymore. Yeah, I like that a lot. I mean, I said to you just before we got on the podcast recording, but 
I never really, I mean, there's definitely days where I drank consecutively for sure, you know, mm-hmm. um, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, and then try and work for a few days and do it all over again. Um, and I've, I've said on the podcast before that my wife once said to me that the happier I got in my life, the less I drank. I love that. Yeah. Which was an interesting correlation because I didn't see it, but she's like, yeah, it seems like, you know, the more that you exercise and you've, you're changing your job situation, we're moving house, the less you seem to need to numb out the dissatisfaction with alcohol. Yeah. And when you can actually be present in your life and deal with stress or deal with whatever mental health stuff you have, whether it be anxiety or depression or something else, you can move on from it. Like alcohol and drinking to cope, it doesn't make anything actually go away. It just makes it wait around and get worse until you are not drunk and you can potentially deal with it. But if you continue to drink it away, things just get worse and worse and worse in the background. Um, and I've found yeah. the same thing much happier. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think, you know, for me, it's uh, just having, again, it's having more time to explore other things. And um, now I've, you know, in the past, my identity when I was younger was so wrapped up around alcohol. And mm-hmm. so I got very much into like brewing my own beer. Um, and I thought that was a really cool thing. So then I got to make beer and share it with people. Uh, I made wine at home for a while and I would bottle that up and I think, oh, I'm saving money because I'm making $30 <laughs> of wine at a time. This is so much more efficient. Um, but then I'd probably drink more of it. And it, but because it was such a, it was such a, um, a highlighted and underlined part of my life thinking that like when Friday comes, because my job was annoying and and not that interesting so you kind of place all of your emphasis and all of your satisfaction in life and everything you're looking forward to is like on friday i get to drink um and then again on saturday and then sunday's like a recovery day but i always would look forward to those things so if you'd said to me when i was 25 years old there'll be some point in your life when you don't care about alcohol anymore or you know if you said to me 25 year old tim if you've got to pick alcohol or you know, uh, money, which one would you choose? I don't know. I might have chosen alcohol and said, look, this is, <laughs> this is a significant part of my life that I really enjoy. It's my release and, uh, it's all very good. And so that shift in my mind to now where I'm, I'm taking it or leaving it more, it seems is, uh, is something that surprises even me. And when I went to this recent wedding, it was the first time I've ever been to a social, you know, since I've been an adult, the first time I've ever been to a social event and not had anything to drink um, and not thought, oh God, it's so boring having to be the designated (laughs) driver. This is terrible. I was like, you know, still dancing, talking to people. Um, I have to admit, like talking to other people when they were drunk was kind of fun (laughs) when I wasn't drunk because I was like, this is interesting. Um, And I was there with my kids as well. So part of it for me is like, setting the right example for my teenage sons not that i'm going to tell them never drink in your life because i did um but you know i think um and i experienced it myself but seeing your parents seeing your your adult in the world your protector your safety being um inebriated and out of control is, is isn't the most settling thing in the world when you're a kid um uh it's just not uh, I think you want to have stability and security. And, and if you're around alcohol and alcohol for you signals like danger or fear or um, uncertainty or, you know, dad's dad's being weird or he's fallen asleep in the corner or he's been sick or, you know, something like that. I think that's going to impact you. It has to. Definitely. Yeah. And it, it teaches you about what drinking means. Um, mm-hmm. And you said something very insightful before that, I want to highlight, you said about, you know, getting through the week to Friday because like, yay, I can drink, you know, and Saturday, woohoo. Um, but life shouldn't be something to just get through and survive. And that's how I felt every day. I just have to get through the day. I just have to get through work, get rid of this hangover. And then my relief comes, then I can drink and feel better. And I was just constantly getting through the days and never enjoying them. 
And when you don't rely on alcohol anymore, whether, you know, you have a problem or not, if you back off or you get sober, whatever that looks like, you can just enjoy the whole experience and, and realize like all of life is nice and, and you don't have to keep like these bad parts in your life that you just have to survive and wait till the reward, your actual life becomes the reward. And yeah. And going to weddings and not drinking is such a good experience. I loved that so much better than drinking weddings (laughs) and embarrassing myself. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, it's just nice to be able to talk to people and have real connection and conversations, particularly these days with everything else that's going on mm-hmm. in the world. Um, but yeah, I think that not not needing to have not needing to have that to have fun is a significant relev- or revelation. It's a significant milestone. And so many when I I did more one on one coaching in the past, and I still times sometimes do it occasionally now but when i speak to people and i say tell me about your life and a big part of it is alcohol related I'm, i i say to people like that is and was for me a big trigger of anxiety um either you know originally it used to be uh, surrounded uh or or more around the hangover now like even or, or more recently let's go back a year ago when i drank um even as i'm like drinking the alcohol that unsettled feeling is like i don't know if it's foreshadowing the stuff that's coming but just that like lack of control is just a bit like oh i I know where this is going and it's not it's not good um there's a i went to this one event in england one time where um it was like a 10-year anniversary of this company i worked at it was a big celebration everybody was in like uh tuxedos and i'd um i think i'd flown from canada to england to go to this event like it was a big deal Anyway, I got to, uh, I took out a few old clients of mine for a couple of beers and I was just so excited and like in the moment and, and not in control or like assessing, not a very good judge of where I was in drunkenness wise, um, that I had a few beers with a client and a few more beers in the kind of hotel lobby. And by the time I got to the event, I was like hammered. I was like head down asleep on the table on these big round tables in this big big uh, dinner formal dinner party that was about to go down and luckily one of my friends is like oh tim we need to take you out of here and you brought <laughs> me back to the hotel and i woke up in complete panic at like four o'clock in the morning fully dressed except one of my shoes which had fallen off and i was like oh my god what the hell happened i've missed the whole thing and that was like the guilt and shame and horrifiedness of the the following days that ensued where I had to phone people and be like, did you see me? And then I, and then, oh my God, somebody shared a picture of like no. the, the 50 people who were at the dinner and I was in the picture like I was before <laughs> I, and I'm like, just right on the, right on the side, big grin on my face. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's times like that where I wonder like what might have happened if I'd been there to experience the whole thing. Um, and so, yeah, I don't, I'm not, I don't look back on my, younger self with like um disappointment or anything it's just i think it's just a you know moving forward making choices that are in your best interest and you know i think for some people alcohol is like just a an absolute no-no because they can't moderate and it's like it becomes an all or nothing and and certainly when i was younger i was definitely the kind of person who would say look Look, Jill, we're not going out for like a couple of beers. We're like going out for 10 or nothing. Like I'm not messing around with this middle ground stuff. That's a waste of time. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I used to get pissed off if I was hanging out with friends and I thought that they were there to drink and they weren't and they just wanted to have a normal social hangout. I used to actually get pissed and like it would ruin my time. And I would have to like go out later or like get something on the way home by myself. And we think like, you know, alcohol is essential for fun, but that doesn't sound very fun. Getting mad at my friends because they didn't want to party and, and your experience, like that's not fun. Real fun was what you had at the wedding that you went to recently. Yeah. I mean, real fun is uh, being able to remember what happened. Um, and I think that, that, you know, a big part of it for me is the guilt shame around, like, I'm not sure yeah. the conversations I had. And I just, I, that's the worst feeling ever is like that sort of, you know, uh, and most of the time we know, cause I've gone back and done the, 
you know, done the forensic investigation into the previous night. And my friend's like, no, you were fine. You just, you did what you always do, Tim. You just went and sat over there and fell asleep. And I'm like, oh, good. Okay. Because I thought I might have said something horrific. And uh, it turns out you were just, you just fell asleep. Um, but yeah, it's, um, you know, it's interesting stuff and uh, it's, it's an interesting topic. So when in, can you share a bit more about when you're, um, you obviously have, your podcast, uh, the Sober Powered Podcast. Can you share some of the insights that you go into on there? Yeah, so I explain like why alcohol causes whatever it's causing for you, whether that be increased anxiety, um, heart palpitations, increased heart rate, um, pancreas issues, mental health issues. And I explain for people like me, why it's so hard to stop drinking. Like, why was it so hard for me to let go of when it was clearly ruining my life? So it's a science podcast. And every episode I go over like the latest literature and all the latest studies on it. That's so cool. Um, yeah. One of the other things I was thinking about was that I'm, I'm, I'm a rabbit holer and uh, <laughs> I think alcohol was my rabbit hole for 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 some time you know i talked about the brewing stuff but one of the things that i think can be beneficial for people who who are sort of in the middle ground of like maybe not alcoholic but they they don't want to feel like that anymore for anxiety reasons let's say um i, I would recommend to, to look for other interests that are gonna you know look for interests that are going to make you healthy as opposed to ones which are going to make you sad um and so for me, I've done that by, you know, getting interested in, um, the health and fitness stuff, obviously stress reduction. Um, I love researching things like cold water therapy, like plunging into the ocean when it's freezing cold or having hot saunas. Um, I'm really into tea making different types of tea. So if I want to have that fix of like, Oh, I'm going to make some really cool special drink. Um, a coffee or a tea of some sort coffee from, for staff. So, those are the, those are some things to sort of, and the 75 hard thing for me, again, for somebody who's a, a rabbit hole, that was perfect. Cause I'm like, now I've got something to focus on. I can get stuck into for 75 days and learn some new habits. Um, and, um, so yeah, I think it's just, if you can consciously replace things, which are a little bit detrimental to things, which are going to lead you into a positive direction, um, and I'm I'm pretty sure if you said to somebody who's suffering with anx panic attacks, anxiety, extreme stress, depression, any of those things, and said, "Look, I can make it, wave a magic wand and make this go away now, but you you'll never be able to drink again." <laughs> will, will you take that trade? Like I would have I would have bitten your hand off for that trade when I was at my worst, right? But as we start to recover and as things change, like oh, I can moderate everything; it'll be fine. I know where I stand, but that's kind of, you know, something to think about, I think, is like, um, if if alcohol is making you feel that way, is, is, would you take that? Would you take that trade or make that commitment? Um, and again, you can just start off and say, look, I'm going to do a month and see how I feel. And maybe I know a lot of people I've spoken to personally, and they're like, yeah, I did a month and then I did three months and now, I did, now it's been 10 years because I just don't care anymore. Yeah. You know? And taking taking a month off will give you a lot of insight into cause and effect. A lot of us don't understand the power that alcohol has to influence our mental health after we're done drinking and taking 30 days off. Like you'll see the connection. Um, if you pay attention to it, like you might see, oh, I've been, you know, 50% less anxious or I've had, you know, I usually have 10 panic attacks a week and now I've had two, or I don't feel as depressed anymore. I'm not feeling guilty. And you'll, you'll start to understand like what alcohol does for you. And then when you have that insight and that understanding into your own mind, it'll help you make better decisions in the future. Um, so I think a 30 day break is definitely the sweet spot. Mm -hmm. And now, and now I think like phase two is that you experience things in your life, which you otherwise would have been alcohol consuming times right like the first time you go to a concert or the first time you go to a wedding or the first time you go to a, a sporting event um, or the first time it's christmas or thanksgiving or something which is normally like a alcohol 
associated thing that you don't drink through is kind of like, huh, what, how about I just do it as an experiment and see if you can go, go and do that without drinking and, and see how it changes your experience. Um, I think that's kind of a neat approach. I mean, I still get, I play um, hockey in a men's league. And so it's customary that somebody brings a case of beer to the game. And after you finish playing, they hand out the cans of beer. So I still feel that little nudge of resistance. I would say I would call it resistance. It's not that I'm going to, it's not that I want to have a beer because I just don't. Um, I'd rather drink water and rehydrate and not have a headache the next morning. Um, but there's always that little moment where somebody's like, you know, looking around the room and throwing the cans of beer around. They look at me and I'm like, no, thanks. And then it never goes any further than that. Um, nobody's ever said, why aren't you drinking? But you, you still have to answer the question, right? Um, because there's a there's a bit of an assumption there that you're going to, maybe Tim's going to have one this time. No, I'm good. Um, yeah. And if you think, you know, no one's going to like me, they're going to make fun of me, they're going to question me or maybe I won't drink, but I won't have a good time. But then you challenge yourself to do it once and not drink and prove to yourself, nobody cares. And I still had a great time. That makes you more confident for the next time. Like I, I just went to my first wedding, not drinking, and I freaked out about it for such a long time. I was so afraid that everyone would give me a hard time and I wouldn't have any fun and I would be miserable the entire time. I had a great time. And now the next time I go to a wedding, it's not even going to be a concern. So proving to yourself that you can do things without alcohol is, is a huge asset. Yeah. And I think just be prepared that there will still be some resistance at times. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, like I've showed up with a, with a four pack or a eight pack of my favorite alcohol free beer to parties before and people are like why are you drinking i'm like uh, i got stuff to do tomorrow so i'm driving i got this stuff let's go you know like i don't want to uh, there's always going to be this is part of human nature this is part of the concept of like when you do things sometimes it holds mirrors up to other people um particularly if you're making changes in your life that are improving yourself or being uh uncommon as i think of it um, so, you know, if you're, let's say you've, you've, you're sticking to a strict diet because you're trying to get in shape or you're trying to lose weight and be healthier, or you're trying to build muscle or whatever your health goal is, you're going to be around people who are eating a bag of chips or eating a Big Mac. And they're going to be like, what are you doing that for? That's weird <laughs> because perhaps they couldn't, or they don't want to, or they're not at that place in their lives. You know, we're all on a, we're all at different stages in a journey and, um, you're at where you're at and uh, other people are, are doing other things. So with alcohol, there's always going to be some people who are going to be like triggered by the fact that you're not drinking. Um, mm-hmm. That's, that's just the truth. It, there will be people who will be like, Oh, that's weird. That's why I kind of, you know, I, I like the idea of just saying I'm an alcoholic and like straight deadpan, give them a Jill deadpan face, <laughs> stare at them. <laughs> I'll do it someday. Uh, it's scary. It's a scary thing to say out loud. It's a big one. I mean, obviously, you're not going to say that in front of your boss's 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 <laughs> boss. Could you imagine though? Everyone would just like, oh, okay. Um, oh, yeah. geez, it's getting late. I think it's yeah. time to go. Off we go. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think that to think that everybody's always going to be cool about it, it's not true because they won't. Not everybody will be. But I think if you, um, you know, there's, there's ways to work around it. You can say you're doing your cleanse. You can say you're doing a fitness experiment or you can, you know, you can, if you're feeling brave, you can be a bit tougher and, or just say like, you know, I got a big day tomorrow and, uh, I gotta be up early. So I'm not doing it. I mean, I feel like when you play in gray areas, that's the people love for a bit of a challenge where they can talk you into it. I just have one, right. Let's just have a, just have a couple of drinks. No, yeah. because I, I gotta get up early. You'll be fine. Versus <laughs> if you say I'm an alcoholic, people are like leave him alone. <laughs> don't, don't ask him again. Uh, it's just a very harsh. It's a very harsh thing, and it's a it's a tough thing because um, you know there's stigma associated with that. There's weakness associated with that as well, mm-hmm. right? So it's uh, it's not a topic to be tackled lightly for sure. Yeah, there's a lot of judgment about what it means to not. Be- be able to handle how much you drink. Um, yeah. So it's a scary thing to tell people 
And that's why for people who are needing to get sober, I will tell them, like, don't make excuses, even though you feel tempted. Like we feel tempted to say, oh, you know, I'm on antibiotics or, Mm. you know, what? Oh, I'm still fun. I promise. Like all these things. But the more information that you provide, just like you said, the more someone can come back and be like, oh, one drink won't hurt. Like, you know, we can get you an Uber. Don't worry about it. Like just stick to. I'm pregnant. (laughs) Yeah. Still, though, you might get pressure from that one. Yeah. You can have a one glass of shot. Yeah, oh, one won't hurt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it might, actually. It might. Yeah. And I think the other thing is, is if, if you're having people who are, if there's people in your social circle who you've attempted to, like, brush off with comments and they're still giving you a hard time, you got to question who you're hanging out with, ultimately, yep. if they're like, or whether that's family or friends, if they keep judging you or giving you a hard time because you're trying to make a serious life change for your own physical, mental health and, and enjoyment of life. Um, you know, I, like you said, the, the concept of like being in a foreign country and, and being able to wake up and go for a hike and explore and taste lovely food and, and see great sights versus like waking up feeling like crap and having to like start drinking again to, endure the rest of the trip it's like a whole different world yeah completely different and some people will still be in a spot in their lives where they do want to just sit around in different locations and drink and we also have to evaluate like who our who our friends are and it doesn't mean they're bad people it just means if you don't want to drink you shouldn't be hanging out with people who want to just sit around and drink you can hang out with them occasionally, but you should also find people who want to go rock climbing or want to do mm. book club or want to do, I don't know, all these other amazing things, go on a hike, play sports together. Like there's people are doing other things and those people don't drink, but the ones who are sitting around, those are the ones that want to drink all the time. And they're going to be the ones that really question you because they don't want the judgment or they don't want to feel bad about themselves or they can't fathom why you wouldn't want to drink all the time like them. Yeah. I think a little part of me just likes being different. So (laughs) if I get to say, if I get to say like, I don't drink, like I I kind of like the, I like the, the sticky part where people are like, why not? You know? Um, But again, because I've done weird diets for so long, people are used to me just being (laughs) odd. Like, yeah, it's just Tim. He's doing another challenge. Just leave him alone. Um. But yeah, I think that, uh, you know, alcohol out of the picture gives you a lot more opportunities to, to fully experience life and, and um, you know, really be connected and, and jump out of bed every morning and, and seize the day versus like suffering through the day. Um, exactly. So yeah, there's lots of great stuff there. And uh, I don't, I don't know what the future holds for me, but I do enjoy talking about this subject and I haven't yet found a great reason to break my uh, streak of non-drinking. Um, and uh, I don't, I don't see it in the near future just because again, I like that clarity and I found some in those little uh, cans of alcohol free IPA. Uh, there's also a really good one I found, which is uh, uh I think it's a coffee stout, which used to be one of my favorite styles, but a coffee stout, which is alcohol free. Mm-hmm. So good. I have a couple of those and I'm like, you know, it's kind of, I feel like I'm cheating. I'm like no alcohol <laughs> and I'm still enjoying it. Yeah. And the longer your streak gets, the easier it is to continue because you don't want to go back on all that amazing time and have to like start your count over. Yeah. Did you, what- did you do like the 12 step process or any formal thing like that? So I go to therapy um, and then I go to meetings occasionally. I actually recently made a friend in my area who goes to meetings in person. So I asked if I could join her. I just feel scared about going for some reason. I don't like everyone there is like me. So I don't know what I'm afraid of, but uh, meetings are a great tool. And with quarantine and all that, now that there are virtual meetings, it's so much easier to go and you can just turn your camera off and blend into the background, but it's a great tool. So I I do both therapy and meetings occasionally. Yeah. And just being able to listen into what other people are dealing with or going through, I think is, uh, is really cool as well. Yeah. And no matter what you've done, someone has done the same thing down to the, the most minor details. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, listen, um, I really appreciate your, you coming on and, and sharing some stories and talking about this subject. I think it's massively interesting. I think, uh, so many people are, are in, in, at least in my community of people with anxiety are, um, and I know cause I've spoken to lots of them who sometimes drink to get beyond, you know, the social pressure when mm-hmm. they go to events. I've been there myself. I used to have to have, you know, two or three drinks and then I would feel like standing up and now I'd be the life of the party. You couldn't shut <laughs> me up. But until that, I felt like I wasn't quite good enough. And, and so I think like, you know, it's kind of, I talk about cultivating courage. Like it's a, a skill that you build up over time. And I think not having alcohol in the picture allows you to feel the the real truth and you don't need to have sort of artificially enhanced confidence. It's like, wow, this is actually how I feel because I'm cognitively switched on. I can remember my conversations and uh, things are good from that point of view, you know? So um, yeah, I think the, the stuff that you're doing and spreading the word is massively important. And um, I'm so glad we got to have a chat today. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me on. Yeah. So if people want to look you up and find out more, what's the best place for them to go? Yeah. So if you search for Sober Powered, um, you'll find me. I'm all over. That's my website, my Instagram, my Facebook group. I'm on YouTube. Um, So just search for Sober Powered and you'll connect with me. You're everywhere. (laughs) I'm taking over. um, What is your daytime um, vocation? I'm a biochemist. I work at one of the companies that created one of the vaccines. Oh, wow. Interesting stuff. Yeah, it feels really cool to be involved in that. Yeah, that is very cool and uh, very topical. Lots going on on that subject for sure. Mm -hmm. I'm going to send you some more questions after this. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not going to go there right now, though. (laughs) I can't legally, so. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Well, thanks for your time, Jill, and uh, all the best. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Anxiety Podcast. For more information, go to theanxietypodcast.com.